here in my garage. Back again? Jesus. Before we get to the video, I'd like to thank our sponsor Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of courses in almost any skill you can think of. I have a link in the description that will give the first 500 people who use it free premium for two months, giving you unlimited access to the website and some other great perks I'll get to later in the video. Now I'll go ahead and hand it off to someone else for a little bit of backstory on the Type 97. Greetings all, Chieftain here. Now I've been asked many times will I please do a Japanese tank on one of my Inside the Hatch videos. Well, the problem is that there aren't really any worth doing anywhere where I tend to go. Johnny does not have this problem because Johnny is near Indiana. And in Indiana you will find a Shinhoto Chiha. And in fact, not just any Shinoto Chiha, this is one that used to be on display at the Ropke Museum and it has a unique turret designed by Suumo. Uh, what they did was they doubled the frontal armor thickness from 25 millimeters to 5 centimeters. And as far as I know, this is the only such vehicle which still exists. So it's worth a look just for its own right. The Japanese get a lot of short shrift in terms of their tanks, and I am no exception in berating the Japanese tank designs, but to a large extent it's undeserved. The Japanese were actually fairly forward-thinking in their doctrine. In 1934, they developed the first independent mixed brigade, and this was an all-arms fighting force of infantry, tanks, artillery, and they were all behind petrol or diesel power. Still though, at the time, the tank was seen as a support to the infantry, so the fact that they tended to have low-velocity guns, like the 57, wasn't much of a problem. Of course, 57 had been invented by 1934, but you, you get my drift. 1942's Armored Division, if you look at that though, this is now a very modern armored division. Uh, it's got four tank battalions, three infantry battalions, an anti-tank battalion, uh, reconnaissance battalion, artillery battalion, engineers, everybody is motorized or mechanized. Even the infantry were going to be transported around in Type 1 full-tracked APCs or half-tracks. Now, of course, what the doctrine said and what could actually be built, given the limitations that the Imperial Japanese Army had at the time, were two entirely different things. So none of the armor divisions ever really were built as they should have been. But the thinking, at least, was there. The other problem that the Japanese had, as I said, was uh, they were using the wrong kind of guns. And after a severe lesson was beaten into them by the Soviets, they realized that they needed a more general purpose tank gun. Enter the 4.7 centimeter found on the Shinhoto she has, as opposed to the earlier low velocity 57 mil. Now, the other thing to remember about the Chiha is that this is a 1938 design. The problem is it went up against 1943 tanks because the Americans, because America, were transporting 30 ton tanks around to the battle. And this was a little bit unfair on the Japanese tanks that were considered by the Americans to be equivalent more or less to the M5 light. But if you think about what the rest of the world was designing and building in 1937 or 1938 when the Type 97 entered production, you suddenly realize that the Chiha is not actually all that bad a tank and has a lot to recommend it. Unfortunately, what was good in 1939 or 1938 is a lot less so in 1942 or 1943. And well, this is a lot of the reason why the Japanese have the reputation. Anyway, that said, bear that in mind as you enjoy Johnny's tour of the Shinoto Chiha. The front of the tank is pretty bare, just like the Hago, but retains a lot of its features. These two hatches that we weren't able to get to move are access points for the transmission, uh, just like on the Hago. Um, the front slope of the tank is 25 millimeters, so not too thick. It gets thickest up on the front of the turret. The only other things on the bow are here's the driver's position over here, and then the port for the machine gun for the bow gunner. This is also the mounting point for a single headlight in the front. The armor is riveted on to a frame, as you can see by all the rivets, which by the time the Chihas had been upgraded like this was very outdated. 
Um, but you'll see a few points on the tank where they actually use welds to try to minimize the number of rivets used for uh, less projectiles inside the tank if it does get hit. Hey, get some footage of this down here. So now we're at the side of the tank. If you look at the running gear, it's very similar to a lot of the other Japanese tanks. It's a bell crank suspension again, but with the Chiha being longer, they had to elongate the suspension uh, to fit the wider hull. So what you see is they've added an additional road wheel at the front and back that is on its own crank and its own spring. Now, uh, from the previous video on the Hago, I mentioned how with just the two bogies pitching on each other, it would probably make for a pretty rough ride. But if you look at footage of a Chi Ha driving along, you'll notice the ride is a whole lot smoother, and enough to where I would say that these additional wheels on the front and back may have sort of solved the problem. Because with the additional wheels, you see as it goes over obstacles, Instead of the two bogies just pushing on each other, they now have a third force to push on and it sort of evens things out and makes it for a whole lot smoother ride. The tracks are nothing special, there's just 96 links per side kept in place by a pin. Back rear you see one of the mufflers and then right here on either side is where you would keep uh, all your tools. This would probably also be a good point to talk about the paint. Um, to my knowledge, this is not an accurate uh, painting of a Japanese tank. This tank was captured in 1943, and what I assume is after it was captured and evaluated, they painted it and then just put it into storage, and to my knowledge it hasn't been painted since then. This one used to be at the Rock Key Museum, and when it was brought here, uh, they just kept it in the state that it was in. She's swaying through my shirt. I'm now here at the back of the tank. You can see it's dominated by the two mufflers at either end back here, and then this large storage box that also has some mounting for some more equipment. You can also here see wiring for what were probably convoy or marker lights here in the back. Also, since the idler is at the back of the tank, the back is where the track is tensioned from. It's a very simple system where you have a small lock that you need to push down on to release, and then you take a large wrench and the idler is just on a screw and it moves back and forth. So the tank is powered by a Mitsubishi air-cooled V12 diesel engine. Uh, the Japanese seem to like using diesel engines in their tanks, one because it was one less fuel source to compete over um, with all the other branches normally using gas, and then two, if the tank were to catch fire, the fuel is less likely to burn. The center hatch here houses the radiator, and if you open it up you just see the radiator there. And then the side hatches here pull, um, sort of, the bottom part pulls down and out, and then the top pulls up, and that's how you would get access to the engine along with this hatch here. The back is also dominated by the large back of the turret, which has the machine gun port for the loader, and then a large hatch in the back that we'll talk about more on the inside. Try to think of all the camera work in the inside the hatch videos and try to do the opposite of that. So now I'm standing in the commander's position, which is dominated by his uh, cupola. He has six vision prisms, which are just uh, little slits that he can see out of with housing and glass over them. Although, as you can see, if this one moves, these screws can unscrew and come up and then this can come down to where he's just looking out of the slit and the, the glass is just for protection. There's also a seventh uh, vision block to look out of and it has the same uh, forward slit, um, but it also, this housing here is to put a periscope into, so you can look through this periscope up and out and not have your head out or not be looking directly through a vision block. Uh, the only problem with this that I can see is there's no hole in the hatch for the periscope to uh, come out through. So, and this, and this um, cupola doesn't rotate. Um, so there's not one on the other side of the hatch either. So basically you'd have to at least have that um, hatch door open to use the periscope, which I think kind of negates the additional safety of having a periscope. Also to command the tank, he has a traverse wheel, which is duplicate to the one on the gunner side, that he will use to roughly lay the gunner onto target. The rest of his position is just dominated by ammunition racks. There's a ready rack here of three, um, there's an additional rack here on the floor, um, there's a rack and a box of ammunition back here, although that's predominantly for the loader, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, and then there's also 
these right here, they've collapsed, but each of these would hold a clip for the machine gun that's behind the loader's position um, for the 7.7 millimeter machine gun. Also, I don't know for a fact, but I believe this would house a box for communications. After filming while doing some additional research and also talking to the chieftain, I realized this was probably the mounting for the push button communication system, in which the commander would have a set of buttons that he would push that would in turn light up a light board near the driver telling him what to do, and this would be used in place of internal vocal communications. However, like many things to do with the interior of this tank, there's not too much reference made to them and much source material, and it's pretty much impossible to find pictures. But given that there were supposed to be 12 buttons and there's 12 holes in this console, I figure that's what it is. On the gunner's position, um, with the 47 millimeter Type 1 anti-tank gun, which fired two types of shells, um, it carried HE shells, about 38 of them. Its predominant role, though, was to fire armor-piercing high-explosive rounds, of which it carried 66. Um, the gunner's setup was relatively simple. He has a shoulder mount right here, and then he has a by 4 telescopic sight right next to the gun. And all he would do was put his shoulder in here, put his hand on the trigger, and then look through the sight like this. His uh, traverse wheel would be right here. It's off on this one, but it's the exact same thing. Would just be right here. So you could turn the turret and then move the gun up and down. There's no coaxial machine gun in this tank. Uh, there's not enough room. The additional machine gun in the turret is actually in the back. We'll get to that in a second. For the gun itself, it is a better, more capable tank killing weapon than what was in the initial production of the Type 97 and also in the uh, Type 95. It still could not really compete with the Sherman though. It could not uh, penetrate the front of a Sherman at uh, medium ranges. So this tank would actually have to close the gap if it wanted to fight um, or take on a Sherman. It was capable of killing it through the side though, but uh, it just kind of goes to show how far ahead the Americans were in their tank design that um, it was actually kind of the opposite of how Europe was with the Sherman and the Panther. This thing was the, I guess for lack of a better term, the Sherman of the Pacific had to close the gap to fight the bigger, heavier tanks. This would be a good time to mention too that there is no turret basket in this tank. Um, all three guys who are in this are moving walking along the floor trying to not trip over the drive shaft as uh, they're traversing this tank and fighting. Um, that's more common on tanks of this size, but once we get into the loader's position, uh, we'll talk more about how that would be particularly difficult uh, in the case of this tank. So I'm now standing in the loader's position. Yes, this is the loader's position. Uh, I moved uh, maybe six inches back from the gunner's position. Um, this is the worst thing ever. Uh, the loader would be here, and in theory, it's, it's not that terrible. He has access to the machine gun in the back, so when the tank is in an infantry support role, you could spin the turret around, and then he would be the main gun supporting uh, the infantry when you don't need the cannon to the front. The uh, ammunition racks are right here, so as long as you don't bash the commander with opening the door, um, you can get the ammunition, pull it out, and throw it in. Um, I'm not sure how he would access uh, the other door here, um, because the commander is going to be standing right where it needs to open, and he would have to reach around, so possibly the loading duty is just turned over to the commander at some point. Um, there are There's a ready rack for four shells um, to his left, just kind of around the gunner. So this position would be really cramped. There's there's a there's a cutaway picture I had where it shows the loader pretty much right on top of the gunner, like the spooning. So it would be a difficult position. The thing that makes it the worst, though, is the fact that if you look here, the engine juts out into the fighting compartment. Now there would be uh, there would be shielding over this, um, just like there is over the drive shaft here, but this shielding is going to come out really tall and really far to where I guess in an ideal scenario you could kind of sit on it but you got to remember um, the tanks gonna be moving around and there's no turret basket so if you're the loader 
and the commander suddenly decides we need to turn the turret all the way to the left, you have to jump over all this housing to get basically to over there in the body. Meanwhile, the gunner is swung around, and he's essentially sitting on this now. Um, I think this, just the, the engine jutting out, would probably be the thing that hurt the fighting capability of this tank the most. I have seen, uh, I think Steve Zaloga mentions it in his book and in a couple diagrams I've seen, that sometimes the loader would not ride along with the crew. And I think that would almost be the better way to fight in this tank, because the commander has access to all the ammunition, he's going to be calling out what to load, um, and, and, and the rounds aren't heavy, you can do it with one hand, you just pick it up and throw it in. So even though there is a loader position in this tank, I feel like having the additional man only just, uh, just hurts the overall performance of the tank. This will also be a good time to mention he has control of the only turret lock in the tank. Um, it's pretty simple, you just pull this down, it's frozen into place, but then this meshes with the gears um, in the turret ring and keeps the turret from turning around. Uh, there's only just this one, but this turret is so light, I imagine that's all that was needed. He also has a singular pistol port up here that he could uh, shoot out of if the tank was being overrun. Here's also an interesting thing I found. This looks like the original piece to clean the gun barrel. The piece itself is in uh, two parts. It has these kind of metal wires at the front for hard cleaning, and then it has uh, these softer bristles behind it. Also to mention, there is a large loader's hatch above the uh, gunner and driver that they could both get out of pretty easily. Um, it's two pieces. This one goes down first, and then this one goes down second, and then it locks there. There is no recoil guard on the gun. Um, I don't think this would be an issue for the gunner or loader since they're so far over, um, but the commander would probably have to watch it. I'm not sure how far this goes back. It's not a very big gun, so I'm sure it can't be too much, um, but he would definitely have to be aware of his surroundings, make sure he doesn't hit his shoulder or something like that. Also, I keep finding throughout the tank um, these wooden pieces that look like they were part of a wooden housing for ammunition. I believe there's a diagram I saw, I'll have to check back, of there being racking for that uh, behind the driver. So I believe all these wooden pieces go to more racking for ammunition a little bit under the gun. I keep thinking at any minute we're just gonna like fall through the bottom because it's so rusted out. So I'm now here in the uh, bow gunner's position. The seat is gone, so I'm uh, kind of struggling at the moment. But one thing I noticed right away was you can kind of see where the seat was mounted and you are right under and next to the gunner. You and he might be interfacing, uh, as you, he, and the loader might be interfacing, especially as the turret turns, if you have extreme turret turns and things like that. Um, my guess is he was told to move his seat up as far as he could if it adjusted and um, just try to stay out of the way. Right here is the mounting point for the Type 95 machine gun. Um, it would have a telescopic sight that would come down and he would just point and aim while looking out like that. Um, the gun does have a lock. I don't think the port moves anymore, but if you want to lock it into place, you just put this up and then it wouldn't move. Um, he also has an additional vision slit right here that has a uh, housing for a glass covering. And those are his only two ways of seeing out. There's no periscope, no anything like that. So his view of the world is very small. Right here you have the mounting point for the radio, which is a Type-C Mark I Model 305 radio. Normally radios uh, early to mid-war were just issued to platoon and company commanders. Um, since this tank was captured in 1942, I assume that means it's a command tank. Uh, standardization of radios only really uh, began to become a thing late war and it was never fully achieved. And then right under him, he has uh, stowage boxes for ammunition for his machine gun. The clips would go in here, they'd be put into place by this guard, and then he'd just pull them out as he needed them. And that's about it. Next we'll look at the driver's position. So I'm now in the driver's position, which is incredibly cramped and awful. For driving, he has a set of tillers to steer the tank, and then this to his left right here is how he shifts. The stick in the center there, from what I could tell from a uh, diagram that was translated to me, is a parking brake. The pedals he uses go clutch on the left, 
brake in the center, gas on the right, just like a lot of cars. There's also a box for comms here where the mounting has fallen off. And then you can see what would have been the horn internally up here. For vision, he has three vision slits right here. Um, the center two are just slits um, that are fixed in place and then they have boxes for glass for mounting there. And then he also has the center one goes up and out for uh, times of low danger to look out more clearly. Also right above him, about here, he'll have a mounting point for a periscope. Uh, but the periscope's gone from this tank. The last thing to mention is there's not a hatch anywhere in the bow of this tank. There's not one for the co-driver and there's not one for the driver. They have to get past their seats, past some racks and everything like that. It would probably take them a while to do this and uh, therefore makes this tank pretty low down on my list as for what I would want to be in. All told, around 930 Shinhoto Chiha were built, including a few converted from older type model Type 97s. Seeing service in Southeast Asia and during the island hopping campaigns with the last batches retained for the defense of the home islands. Although a good design for its time, the tank never lived up to its goals against heavier tanks from the United States, leaving it with the reputation of being a failed design. And this brings me to a bigger point. This is the second tank that I've done one of these Inside the Hatch videos on, and the third one about Japanese tanks in general. And in the process, they've really become some of my favorites. But in doing this, I've realized that the discussion and source material on them, especially compared to other tanks of the war, is very lacking. Now part of that is certainly the fault of the designers and commanders of the Japanese army, that more than likely destroyed unknown volumes of technical documents on the tanks before what they saw as an imminent invasion of the home islands. And I'm sure you saw the results of that in this video, for the sheer number of things I simply couldn't find information about, regardless of who I talked to or where I looked. But along with that, there's almost no discussion or at least very little devoted to these vehicles during the war. And I hope that changes. Not necessarily because of me or anything, just because I'd like to see more discussion about it. If anybody has information on anything I assumed incorrectly or couldn't find out about, I would love to hear from you and see any materials you have. Digging into this almost forgotten aspect of the war has been one of the most enjoyable things I've done on my channel so far, and I would love to open up a discussion about anything else that's out there. Again, thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. What is unique about Skillshare is that it doesn't offer just academic knowledge, but focuses on things you can use and incorporate into your daily life. New skills. I myself have been taking the Conversational German course by Scott McElroy. They have a new feature too, where after you begin taking courses and advancing in skills, you can join groups of other people learning similar things to collaborate and share ideas on this platform. Don't forget to use the link in the description box for two months of free premium to their over 23,000 courses. Along with an all-access pass to the website, you can watch all classes with no interruptions and download any course to watch offline at your leisure. Remember, this is only for the first 500 people though, so remember to sign up before time runs out. There are also a few other people I would like to thank. Firstly, the owner and staff of the Indiana Military Museum, who put up with me coming to film the weekend of their event, and to our guide especially for tolerating the heat while we were filming. Also, thank you to the Chieftain for featuring on my video, just out of the kindness of his heart. His Inside the Hatch videos were a huge inspiration to me, clearly on this video, but also in the creation of my channel as a whole in the year leading up to it. Be sure to go check out and subscribe to his channel if you haven't already, and I'll have that link below. Also, thank you to a couple specific patrons of mine who helped me out tremendously on this video. QAZ for help with a lot of the footage and interior pictures that I showed. What is Moo for finding some sources on the interior, he also has a channel if you want to check it out, and also Shobu for a lot of translation help with various diagrams that I could only find in Japanese and were invaluable for figuring out what so many interior components were. And lastly, I'd like to thank my patrons in general, some of whose names you'll see here on screen. Going back to the museum and filming this video was one of my milestone goals that I could not have reached without them, and by extension set me on this path of exploration into Japanese tanks that I am so very grateful for. Hope everyone liked the video, and I'll see you on the next one. Here in my garage, got this new Type 97. Fun to drive around Southeast Asia. You know what I like more than this Type 97? Knowledge on how it works. Going out targets. Um, he has 